give yourselves a big hand. Come on, let's thank the band for doing a great worship today. Amen. How many of you believe that God answers prayer, that when you pray, God answers prayer? Of course, sometimes it takes, it takes a revelation for you to know. You know, when I say revelation, I don't mean that it's something spooky. In other words, you get it in your heart. I get it. Everybody say, I get it. Okay, so there are some things that it'll take a bit of time. So some of you are searching, you're coming to church, you're feeling, getting a feel, you're open, but you don't get it yet, but you're still coming and that's good. Because one day you will get it and you will know deep in your heart that God answers prayer. But how many of you know this young man, this handsome two young men, what their names are? Anybody knows what their names are? Shame on you. <laughs> That's Bobby and Kelvin, isn't it? Bobby and Kelvin from Nigeria. Give them a big welcome. Give them a big welcome. I want you to mob them and get to know them, two handsome men. Make them feel really at home. We love you. We welcome you in the name of Jesus. As I asked you just now, how many of you believe that God answers prayer? Yeah. yeah. Some of you are not sure. That's okay. One day you will know. Well, there was this church that's really popular uh, in America. And uh, they, they're known for their prayer and the miracles that go on. But well, one day a bar opened up right in front of the church, right in front of the church, a bar, a bar opened up right in front of the church. And the church was so annoyed and they started to pray against that bar. And as they began to pray, one day lightning struck that bar and it burnt it down. Well, the owners of the bar took the church to court and sued them because the owner said, well, you prayed, our bar burnt down. But the church denied that they were the ones who were responsible for the electricity and the lightning and all of that. And so when it came time for judgment, the judge said, this is a very peculiar case. He said, on one hand, the bar owners believe in God that he answers prayer, but the church completely denied that God did it and God doesn't answer prayer. Okay, you didn't get it. You might get it for lunch. <laughs> Sorry. Turn around someone, touch them and say, God bless you and you may be seated. Bless you. It's slow, but you're worth waiting for. Come on, be seated, everybody. <laughs> you like that, David? <laughs> A controversy, yeah? I'm going to continue two weeks ago what I shared. Who in hell, and again, it's not a swear word, but what in hell, now that two weeks ago, what in hell is stopping you if you say you're a Christian that is slowing you down, causing you to live an average, mediocre Christian life when you know that God wants the very best for you? Now, I'm not talking about driving in your next Rolls Royce or buying your third house by the sea. I'm not, all of that is great. I'm talking about that because you say that you're a Christian, that you know God in an intimate, wonderful way. It's not spooky, it's not weird. But if people were to ask you, who is God to you, can you articulate, can you say, like, if you can't, then just sing them the song that we sang. He's a good, good father. He's a good father. He's a wonderful, wonderful friend. And I've noticed during the worship in our services that some of you are declaring no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Then there are others who don't have any more words. The only word they can, they can articulate is, oh, whoa, and that's all they can say. And that's good. Did you know that whoa is a Bible word? Some people say all oh, these charismatics, they are so shallow. Their words are like, whoa. Well, Jesus said, whoa, any one of you thirst, come and drink. In the book of Isaiah, it says, Whoa, or oh, all you people, my people, I provided for you a redeemer. So sometimes when you run out of words, you, you can, you've got no more words to articulate. But two weeks ago, I talked about what in hell is stopping you. Taken from the passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 16. And in Matthew chapter 16, the Bible tells us that Jesus, can you put the whole, whole uh, scripture up, please? The whole scripture, yeah? All right, so that's just one verse. Let's put the whole scripture up. So Jesus gets his disciples and he says to them, because he's about to announce the greatest institution, the greatest 
thing that God would ever want to do on planet Earth. And that was, he was going to announce about his church. And you might see how the media says things about the church. And we might seem to be very, a very small group. But I want to tell you something. That the most powerful thing on the planet today is the church of Jesus Christ. So Jesus sits with his disciples and he's about to announce to them what he's about to do. And so he asked them this question, who do men say that I am? Remember that? Two weeks ago we talked about it. And the answer came back from the disciples, some say, some say. And I want to tell you that that can knock a lot of Christians about what they are hearing, what some people say. Some people say, all religions have a well of life. You can drink in any one of them and you will find salvation. Some say that Jesus wasn't even real. It was the imagination of Christians in the first century. Some say that yes, Jesus was real, but he was just a man. He was not all that the Christians have pictured him to be. Some say, I believe in Jesus, that he taught good morals. He was a good teacher. Some say, some say, and today because of the use of media, and we thank God for media, actually it's one of the best gifts that we have ever had. You know, I, I keep in touch with my friends and our team members every day on media, and it's so convenient. So what's the media today saying about Jesus Christ? So some people get knocked about, especially when it comes to Good Friday and Easter well, they have a topic, you know, on CNN or some news and they will say Jesus, the man or the myth. And some say that Jesus actually died, that there was no resurrection. Great Christian leaders, even in the Christian nations of America and the Western world, today deny anything about the Bible. Why would Jesus want to turn water into wine? Why would he walk on the storm? What was he trying to prove so they try to water him down. Some say, and some Christians have been knocked about by what some people say. So Jesus turns around and he doesn't debate about what some people say. And I get irritated when I talk to Christians and say, did you hear? I heard somebody say this about this pastor in Singapore and about that church and some people say, and I heard. And I get very ticked like you've got no voice. You, you, you've got, you, you, you have a brain, I hope you use it or lose it. And the way that you're talking is like nothing's happening. And as I said before, there are three kinds of people. Some people make things happen. Some people watch things happen. And some people wake up and say, what happened? <laughs> Which one are you? If you're going to live a life that's productive, a life that is ordained by God to live on purpose and to achieve the things that God has planned for you, you've got to have certain revelation and certain convictions in your own heart. Don't be, don't be in Malaysia, we say lalang, it's, it's a long grass, wherever the wind blows. You've got to know, have a revelation. Jesus turned to his disciples, and if he was here, and he is here, but if he were to take you into that room at the side there and ask you one-on-one, -on -one, who do you say I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, Peter, you're a blessed man. And then we talked about it two weeks ago. And he says, your name is Simon, but I now call you Petros, which means a stone. But I will build you, and I will build you on this rock. And he called himself Petra. It's the bedrock, the cornerstone. So Jesus wasn't talking about building the church on Peter, and that's where, you know, we love our Catholic brethren, but that's where we got it wrong. And so they thought that through the lineage of Peter, listen, Peter never even went to Rome, but today the Catholic church, bless them, I'm not against Catholics, don't get me wrong, I'm just telling you, so that you will wake up and have a revelation, understand, and for heaven's sake, if you have a Bible, read it. Sadly, many Christians would have a Bible, but they expect somebody else to read it and interpret for them. All they'll do is put it up on the shelf when they go home from church. They'll have a big King James Bible under their armpit, and when they go home, they'll put it there, or they'll put it under the pillow to keep them from having bad dreams. So God wants you to read His Word. He wants to speak to you. And so Jesus never said He was going to build His church on any of the 
uh, uh, apostles. I mean, they were just mere men. He never, he said, I will build it. And the Bible tells us again and again that Jesus is the solid foundation on which the church is built. All right? So Jesus did say, anyway, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell. So he says to us today, what do some people say? And you'll always find some people saying something. So you got people who have been to Bible college and they are Bible scholars and theologians. And they will say, well, in my opinion, after all their learning, after all their studying, they will say, in my opinion, Jesus was just a man. And so you find musicals were written about Jesus. Many years ago, before many of you were born, there was a movie called Jesus Christ Superstar. And, and it's a picture of him being so human. And Mary Magdalene falls in love with Jesus. So she sings that song. I uh, forgot what her name is. Helen something or other. Anyway, it's an old song. Um, I don't know how to love him. She says, I don't know how to feel. So it was like everybody's trying to picture Jesus as human or, or he could be fallible or, and all of that. Jesus today will ask you this question. Who do you? Say that I am. And I pray that, and I've been praying this past week, that you will catch a personal, have a personal revelation of who he is. That you will know him as a good, good father. That you will know him as your shield, as your hope. That you will know him intimately. That when people look you in the face, and when you stare, your storms, when they, when they face you, you won't be wishy-washy and say, I don't know why God's doing this to me. And that's how a lot of Christians behave, sadly. And so you find that they are not built on a solid rock. They're wishy-washy. They're slippery. Oh, I'm confused. Oh, I'm offended. And so I pray that these two weeks that God will give you a revelation because he said, I will build my church. And the church is not a building. And when he spoke those words, he was speaking to his disciples in a place called Caesarea Philippi, a beautiful by the seaside sort of a, a resort. And I said that two, uh, you know, two weeks ago, that if you went there today, there is no church building. Imagine, he said, I'll build my church, and there's no first church building. When you go to Jerusalem, you've got church of the sepulchre and the church of the crowns, and the church, you go up to Gethsemane, the church uh, uh, of the thorn crowns. And churches everywhere. Now, what I'm trying to say, I'm not condemning any of them, but I'm telling you that the church is not a building. It's not even our program. It's not even our doctrine. The church is people like you and I. So when he said, I will build my church, he spilled his blood. He gave his Holy Spirit. He sealed you. You belong to God. And he says, you know what? I want to let you know who you really are. That even the gates of hell will not prevail against you. Now, once you catch that as a revelation, let me tell you something. You go for your interview, you'll be calm. When you face a rejection, your boyfriend dropped you, and you, you know, and some, and some big, massive, uh, you won't go, I'm confused. Why would God let this? He was the perfect one. He had the dimples in all the right places. And his eyes, when he blinked, they battered at me. Oh, I'm so, God, where are you? Who are you? Why are you? Today, I want to talk. In my second message, I took a long time introducing this. Just to let you know that it's available. You can uh, get it on our Facebook. My message of two weeks ago. Today, who in hell is stopping you? And there are people that are assigned by hell. Now, I don't want you to go on a witch hunt. I wonder whether this man is demonic. Or, I don't want you to behave like that. But you need to grow up and realize that you have, firstly, an identity with Christ. Do you know who you really are? Stop running to people to get your identity. Facebook is great. Instagram is wonderful. Your chats are fantastic. But if you are running and looking to people to get one more like and one more heart, and if you didn't get it, you're all nervous. Let me tell you, your life will be miserable. But your life will be wonderfully contagious and full of spunk if you know exactly who you are. You, don't, you are unique. There'll never, oh, thank God. There'll never be another you. We can only handle one. <laughs> After they made you, they broke the mold, man. You, you're just, you know, 
You are. You need to realize that you are special. This is how. This is what Jesus said to Peter. Now you got that right when Peter said, "You are the Christ, the Son of the Living God." Now let me tell you who you are. I'm telling you, understanding and finding your identity will stop the nonsense that goes on in church. In Christianity, we are. The gates of hell are not supposed to be stopping you. What's stopping you? Oh, I'm not, I can't serve because I was offended and I was hurt and God didn't answer my prayer. Why did so-and-so die of cancer? Why did that baby die? I don't have the answer. I'm not God. And I don't even want to pretend I have the answer. But I'll tell you what, you've got to get up and start, keep on living. Because there is a, the fact that you're not dead. You're talking about why so-and-so died. But you're not dead. And the fact that you're still alive means you have a purpose to live for. So you need to know that identity is so important. Let me just share with you. You might have heard this before. I've taken it from uh, one of these magazines. You can Google it. It's about two years old. Meet the 52-year-old father who denies, who identifies himself as a six-year-old girl. He's 52 years old, but he identifies himself as a six-year-old girl. Let me read it to you. In an interview with Gay News site, The Daily Extra, a 52-year-old Canadian father of seven explains how he now identifies as a six-year-old girl. I can't deny, he says, I was married. I can't deny I have children. Stephanie, that's his name, Voix or whatever. But I've moved forward now and I've gone back to being a child. I don't want to be an adult right now. I have a mommy and a daddy, adopted mommy and daddy, who totally are comfortable with me being a little girl, he tells the reporter. And their children and their grandchildren are totally supportive. They're used, I, I used to be eight years old, an eight-year-old girl, but later I went and became younger at the, at the insistence of my adopted sibling. A year ago, I was eight and she was seven. And she said to me, I want you to be my little sister, so I'll be nine. I said, well, I don't mind going to be six. So I've been six ever since. Now, John Hopkins, psychiatrist, I'm telling you that not to make fun of people, but today, it is even to the church, we are pressured, we are told by our society this day, people are beginning to want to find their own identity. So you might be a 52-year-old man, and you would like to use the ladies' bathroom because you feel like a six-year-old girl, and you cannot contest that, even though it's only some. Again, I'm not... Or oh, it's a very sensitive thing to talk about it in the Western world. Okay? Because you must respect their choice of their identity. So you could be black, but you could just say, look, I'm white. And people must respect that. And they've got lawyers who will defend your choice. Because you've got money, lawyers will fight for you too. That's his identity. So you have to treat him as a white boy or a or a white person, and it's true, this has happened. A girl who was, had white parents said that she's black in America. And there was a court case because somebody says, but I see your parents and I see you, you're white. She says, look, I'll take you to court. So people are fighting about their identity. Now, as children of God, I hope you know who you are. Now, let me go on to talk about John Hopkins psychiatry. Transgender is mental disorder. Sex change is biologically impossible. So Dr. Paul McHugh, a former psychiatrist, said this. He said that transgenderism is a mental disorder that merits treatment, that sex change is biologically impossible, and that people who promote sexual reassignment surgery are collaborating and promoting a mental disorder. We're not saying that they are mental, that they are mad. It's a disorder. Dr. McHugh, the author of how many books and, you know, uh, 125 pre-reviewed, so on and so forth, commented on Wall Street Journal, and he explained that transgender surgery is not the solution for people who suffer a disorder of assumption, quote, unquote. 
The notion that their maleness or their femaleness is different than what nature assigned to them biologically. He also reported on a new study showing that the suicide rate among transgendered people who have reassigned surgery is 20 times higher than the suicide rate among non-transgendered people. Dr. McHugh further noted studies from so on and so forth that for over a period of time, those who had sex change, more than 80% of them spontaneously lost their feelings. While the Obama administration, Hollywood, and major media such as such and such promote transgenderism as normal, Dr. McHugh says, policies makers and the media are doing no favor either to the public or the transgendered by treating their confusion as a right in the need of defending rather than as a mental disorder that deserves understanding, treatment, and prevention. I want to say to you, we are not anti-bisexual, homosexual, transgender. This church is not anti-anybody. Everyone is welcomed in the presence of God. We love people. It is not my job to, to, to uh, give you an identity. It is your job to have an identity in Christ Jesus. So before you can identify yourself as such and such, it is very important that you answer the question that Jesus asked his disciple. Who do you say I am? Once you have a revelation of who Jesus is, you will begin to realize that now you are a child of God, a son and a daughter of God. You will get that correctly. Many years ago during... My time when I was growing up during the 50s, I'm sorry, into the 60s and 70s. <laughs> young people would want to go about trying to find themselves. So it was the era of the Beatles. And so you would find Ringo Starr, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, and George Harrison. They were our heroes. And in fact, their music were totally way ahead of time, the Beatles. Until today, people are trying to play their music. And to me, they were the best. And, you know, they are the greatest. But they went into an era being young people. And in that era, people were going around the world trying to find themselves, their true identity. So the Beatles went off to India and they went to see the Maharishi Yogi. No, not Yogi Bear, Maharishi Yogi. And so they got little flowers in their hair and they started the chanting. And that's where George Harrison, who's one of the world's best guitarists, learned to play the sita. And he met uh, uh, Ravi, Krish, Ra Ravi, Ravi Shankar, uh, the great. And, you know, it was all that. And that began to flow all across England. People were walking around barefooted singing, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Hare. I know all that because, you know, all these yellow people started coming everywhere. And we're not against them. And every, and every time when I go overseas, when I'm sitting at a cafe or something in Australia, and you get these fellas coming around the yellow clothes. And people used to, and they'll be singing. These are white people who just want to be Something that you're not. And what are they doing? Oh, you can't say anything about it. Again, we're not condemning any religion. They are trying to identify themselves. And so we find that error of people. Today, it is the LGBT. And so even though they are some, but they are spoken about as the majority. And churches and pastors can be sued if they refuse to accept two men who want to get married, you must do their wedding. And so in America, while the previous administration was establishing all these things, churches were being incriminated because we said, no, you're a man, you're a woman. The Bible put two people together, a man and a woman. And so we can do your wedding, but... All of that. Why? Because people... So I want to say to you, if you are in any way confused about who you are, I'll tell you the best way to wake up and define who you really are is to know that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. To know Him as your Lord and as your personal Savior. You do not define yourself as I'm an ex so-and-so. No matter what you have been through, or I'm a, I'm a, you know, I, 
I'm a divorcee. And everywhere you go around, you carry that story. I've been divorced. I've, I've, been, I've been hurt by a man. That is not who you are. You are a beautiful daughter and a son of God who is forever loved. And not only does God love you, He likes you. And while you may not even like yourself, I pray that after this service, you stand in front of the mirror and you say, you're a handsome devil, you. I like you. If I got to know you, I like you a lot. Because there are some people who are, who are disqualifying themselves every day because you made some mistakes. Welcome to the real world. Everybody has had some mistake or is married to one. But you do not define yourself, oh, we are a dysfunctional family. I came from a dysfunctional family. But when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I wasn't going to say that we will have a dysfunctional family because my parents were dysfunctional and my great-grandmother came from India and she, she was a horrible witch. And so my family are going to be full of witches and warlords. That doesn't define me at all. Let me give you a scripture here, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Is this helping anybody? Yeah. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. Look, this is what the Bible says. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Now, that doesn't mean we don't realize he's from Nigeria, she's from Cambodia. No, we know all that. All right, that's a given. We, are, we get that. But we do not see you as a victim. We do not see you as a person who's been in jail, has a record. That may have happened, yes, in the natural. But in Christ, you're a child of God. And upon God's word, we love and accept people. We don't tell them, get rid of your drugs, get rid of your tattoos, get rid of your earrings, get rid of all those things you have. We say, come to Jesus just as you are. He loves you. He's not intimidated by your sin and by your past. He's not impressed by what you think you might have been impressed with. He loves you. He won the battle just for you. He said, I will build you and the gates of hell. You know, it bores me. I know I should be a pastor. I must be a nice person. I must be kind and patient and all of that. So that's why I don't do much counseling. <laughs> because it's a waste of your time. It's a waste of my time. It's a waste of your money. There are people that God has gifted in our church who can do counseling. My wife is one of them. She will love you. She will love you. She will comfort you. She will hug you. My wife's the kind of person, I've said this before. She will meet you for the very first time. Shake your hand. Ten months down the road, she'll still remember who you are. She'll be able to tell you what your temperature was on that day. Everything. <laughs> to me, I will just tell you, Suck it up. <laughs> Get over it. Cry, go ahead. I'll give you a box of tissues. Go ahead and cry a river. And then build a bridge and get over it or you will die in your lack of self-esteem. And that's what kept the church. It is, why do you think the Western church is pathetic? And I'm not saying general, I'm not saying, you know, I mean, I'm just saying generally. I'm not saying because there's a great revival happening in the West. Why do you think that people could walk all over them and curse them to their face and kill them? And mean, why do you think, you think that happened overnight? Let me tell you something. Years ago, before communism took over Russia, years ago, before Stalin and all of them made Russia a communist. It was a staunch Orthodox Christian nation. Do you know what happened just before Stalin took over? Do you know what they were fighting about? What kind of color should the choir members wear? What tablecloth should be used for communion? They were fighting among the churches about non-essentials. Instead of praying in the name of Jesus, because there was a threat that was coming to take that freedom away. So when I look at myself and the church of Jesus Christ in Malaysia, 
not talking about other countries. That as long as we are politicizing everything, feeling that we are victims and, and we are a minority, as long as we are on a back stance and we are taking all the onslaught of hell, Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against you. That's not a back stance. In other words, you know, gates are meant to keep you out. In other words, we are going, it's, you know why hell is bothering you at all? Because you're doing something, you're taking territory, you're moving forward, you're doing something for the glory of God, and hell's threatened, they are losing ground. So that's why they even pay attention to you. If you're doing nothing at all, they leave you alone. You're the kind, the exact kind of person they want on their team. Just let them be calm and cool. But because, so let's go back to that verse. Yet now we know him, it says Christ. We've known Christ according to the flesh, yeah. Thank God for the miracles, yeah. Turning the water into wine, all that's cool. But we do not see him as gentle Jesus, meek and mild, always was a little child. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. Now we see him as king of kings, lord of lords. We sing songs like no weapon formed against us shall prosper. We sing songs about you are a good, good father, you Deliver us, you save us. We no longer see him as what we saw, although we love the Gospels, but that's not how we picture Jesus. We see him as a coming ruling king, and most of the things you read in the book of Revelation, they are figurative. I mean, he's coming, and out of his mouth comes a sword. I mean, if you took that literally, it's very hard to eat when you've got a sword sticking up. <laughs> but some people take it literally, riding on a horse like as if he can't come in a blink of an eye. So he needs a horse. So he's talking everything about figuratively. You know what I'm talking about? But he is no pushover. He is no backbone spineless. Oh, it's okay. I'll turn the other cheek. He's coming in as God. He's going to rule the world. So here he writes, even though we have known him in the flesh, according to the flesh, we don't know him any longer. And in verse 17, everybody look at this. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Oh, my parents were divorced when I was only a child. Or my dad left us and my mother was an abusive woman. That may be true and we feel your pain, but in Christ, you're no longer the old. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. So as a new creation, let me ask you, what in hell is stopping you? You're a new creation. Okay? Don't answer that question. Just keep quiet. Keep looking at me. I want you to look at another scripture in Mark. And in Mark's gospel, Jesus is with his disciples. In Mark chapter 8, verse 15, he charged them and he said, Take heed, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. So I just want to very close, by closing, talk about these two, two types of people, two types of groups that has caused many Christians to stop in their tracks when God is calling them to move by faith. Start serving Start giving. Learn to pray. Don't get the whole church to be praying for you all the time. That's good. The church will pray. This is a house of prayer. But you are a child of God. God doesn't have granddaughters or grandsons. He has sons and daughters of God. So you don't have to come to me as your mediator and say, pray for me. I'll pray for you. I mean, we're two agree just now when Kenny was sharing. There's power in agreement when we come together. But you got to learn to stand up and fight for some of your fights. Instead of backing down all the time. And that's exactly what the enemy wants to do. So there are two groups of people. The Pharisees and, the Her and, and, the Her and Herod's groups. And it, Jesus talks about beware of them. Now the context of them is from verse 11 to verse 25. So Jesus had just finished feeding... 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread. If you study scripture chrono chronologically, you will find that earlier he had fed with five loaves and two fish, 5,000 people. Now when he says 5,000 men, he's talking about families. So there are about 15, 20 odd thousand people that Jesus fed with five loaves and two fish. Shortly after that, he does the miracle again. This time 4,000 families with seven loaves of bread. When he had finished doing that, the Pharisees rushed to him. They didn't care about the miracles. They rushed to him. Can you show us another sign? 
Can you show us another sign? We want to really, really, really see you do some mumbo jumbo magic. So that, you know, like, if, like, remember when he was on the cross? If you're the son of God, get off the cross. Come on. Do some kind of magic. How many of you know that Jesus is not a magician, but he's a miracle worker? He's not out to impress you. So in the Bible, whenever uh, things happen, miracles happen, like when he turned water into wine, raising Lazarus from the dead, feeding with the five loaves and two fish, the Bible calls them signs. Everybody say signs. S-I-G-N-S. They were signs. They were signs. And from each of them, he taught them who he was. When he fed them with the five loaves and two fishes, he stopped and said, are you carried away by this? He says, don't you know, I am the bread of life. That sign was meant to be pointing towards me. When some of you went for your church camp in Ipoh and you were driving or went in a bus, and when you saw the sign, Ipoh, did the bus driver stop the bus and all of you went and run and hug the sign? Oh, Ipoh. The sign is not the thing. The sign is the thing that points to the thing. Now, God's going to do mighty miracles. You're going to get jobs. God's healing your body. God has done many miracles and will continue to do miracles. But they were meant to point you to him. So if you want to enjoy miracles happening, praise God, I got a job, wonderful. It's meant to point you to become a disciple and a follower of Jesus. No turning back. You will learn what it is to be a tither, a giver. It's not a question, well, I thought it was Old Testament. No, it's a sign that's telling you he is the one that will be your provider. The, the economy can tank around the world. Reception, re, uh, recession can explode. There can be all kinds of insecurities in this world. But if you are a child of God, you know my God will supply all my needs. My God will supply. According to his riches, not the Hong Kong dollar or the Japanese yen or the American dollar. If my God, he will supply all my needs. My God. He never runs out. Never runs dry. So come back to this passage of scripture where Jesus is talking about the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. He says, when they arrived, verse 16 onwards, and I'm reading from the Message Bible. When they arrived, the Pharisees came out and started in on him, badgering him to prove himself, pushing him up against the wall. Provoked, he said, why does this generation clamor for miraculous guarantees? If I have anything to say about it, you will not get so much as a hint. There's Jesus talking. I'm not going to show you any signs. He then left them and got back into the boat and headed for the other side. But the disciples forgot to pack. This just after feeding 4,000 people. 4,000 people. All right? Bread everywhere. Big buffet. Big spread by the hillside. Breeze of the sea coming. Jesus feeding people just like that. But the disciples get into the boat and they forgot to pack a lunch. Except for a single loaf of bread. There wasn't a crumb in the boat. And Jesus said, be very careful, keep a sharp eye for the contaminating yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. Meanwhile, the disciples, watch this, were finding fault with each other because they had forgotten to bring bread. Jesus overheard it and said, why are you fussing? Because you forgot to bring bread. Don't you see the point? Watch this. Do you not get it? Don't you see the point of all of this? Don't you get it at all? Remember the five loaves I broke for 5,000? How many baskets of leftovers did you pick up? And they said 12. They got that right. And the seven loaves for the 4,000? How many bags full of leftovers did you get? Seven, they said. And Jesus said, and you still don't get it. <laughs> it's almost laughable. But before we laugh at the disciples... Let's ask ourselves this question. When you were sick and it only seemed like a headache and you told people to pray for you in Jesus' name and you got healed, you thought, well, it was just a flu, it was just a headache. Unbeknown to you, it could have been worse. Just because you didn't see it. 
It could have affected other organs in your body. You could be hospitalized. Being a pastor for that long, I've seen people regress, young people, in their health. And because they didn't know who to turn to. But you've got a church that Jesus said, I will build and the gates of hell is never going to stand against this church and this church prays for you and your connect group prays for you. Ah, it was just a little blip on my computer screen. You went through a difficult time. You had no idea people were planning some things against you. But you said, please pray, church. I'm going through a difficult time in my job. My company is going through some difficult... And the church prayed for you. And you thought you just got over it because of your good look? And Jesus says to you, don't you get it? Don't you still... You still don't get it? That all these things I will do for you are just signposts towards me. So Peter, who do you say? I am. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And when we catch that revelation, my God, my God, you are my God, my Lord, my best friend. You are a good, 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 benevolent, rich, prosperous, friendly father. I am a friend of God. Well, so-and-so just deleted me from their Facebook as their friend. Big deal. But I'm a friend of God, and I'm on his Facebook. And we see each other face to face, and he likes all the time. I am a friend of God. Now, when you catch that revelation... Jesus says, the gates of hell. And mind you, we live in a real broken world. Some of you are living in hell. Some of you are, you're, you might be married to someone that came out of hell. <laughs> and no matter what your condition is, if you've been reading your Bible and you've got a revelation from God, Sure, we need counseling. Sure, we need people to stand with us in prayer. I know all of that. Ultimately, you got to get up and have that answer. You are my God. Otherwise, it was just a free lunch. Five loaves and two fish. So many of those thousands of people who had their lunch when Jesus broke the bread was just a free lunch to them because they didn't take anything out of that. It was just free lunch. And you know, after this service, you'll have free lunch. And if this service was all about just that, you missed the point. Jesus wants you. And he wants to bless your life. He wants to forgive your sin. He wants to partner with you. He wants to be the best friend. He wants you to know him as a good father. Well, I've had a bad father, some of you might say. I hate Father's Day because it reminds me of my dad and his abusive ways. Get over it. Come and embrace a good, good father who loves you. I've never known father's love. Come on Father's Day next Sunday. And listen to stories of ordinary guys who've been through life and challenges. I'm a father. I never see myself as a perfect father. I'm very thankful that all my three girls love God. And to look at generations now, to me, that's my key. I fight for relationship. To me, when our families go through challenges, I put family priority first. Relationship with my daughters, my son-in-laws, my grandchildren first. Of course, God's first, yeah? You know what I'm talking about. Relationships, very important. Very important. So if I'm wrong, I apologize. I will go to that length. I don't say, well, I'm an Indian man. You know, we Indian people, we have, you must say you're sorry. Because my father was an Indian, my grandfather was an Indian, and we Indian people have a very strong backbone. Mm, yeah. I will say I'm a child of God. I offended my, took my grandson the other day and took them out to the zoo. And the Malaysian zoo is shocking, isn't it? I haven't been to the zoo since my children were small. After that, we've always been going to the Singapore Zoo. But I want to take the boys. They love the out. I love to take them to the outdoor. When my girls were small. Every time it was outdoors, I took them different parts of the world as God allowed me to. But, so I took my grandsons, three of them, chucked them in the car, 
my wife took them to the zoo. And before we went on that journey, I sat with my two older grandsons and I said, I want to talk to you both. One is 11, one is seven. And I said, you know, I want to apologize. I want to say, Grandpa wants to say, I'm sorry. And they didn't even know what I was talking about. I said, some months ago, I scolded you and I, I was too harsh on you. And I just want to say, I'm very sorry. Mm. I said, what do you say when somebody says they're sorry? I forgive you. Good. Forgive. <laughs> All right. So I get out now. <laughs> You will never have a good, perfect marriage and perfect family, but you can always have a perfect God. If you don't get it, you've just had free lunch. That's all. Another miracle. Oh, thank you, Jesus. But once you get it, once you get it, everybody say, I got it. I got it. Yeah, I got it. Jesus asked, didn't you get it? Didn't you get it? Everybody say, I got it. I got it. I got it. I know. I know who I am. I'm a child of God. So before you get into a clique of people, so he mentioned two groups. He said, watch out for the yeast. The yeast is, is something that's very little, right? Those of you who bake bread and bake cakes, you put a little bit of yeast in your, in your flour or whatever, your dough, and then it, it expands it, right? You know, just a little bit, that's all, that builds the cake or expands the cake. And he warned about two groups of people, the Pharisees, talking about the Christian group, the religious people. Jesus was, that was toughest with the Pharisees and the scribes. He would say things like this to them, unashamedly. It was really shocking. In Matthew 23, in verse 20, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He never talked to people like that. A woman caught in adultery, he calls her daughter. You know, the leper, he says, he says to you, Man, go your way, your faith has made you whole. He embraced the sinners, he loved them. He forgave them before they even asked him to forgive. Your sins are forgiven. Before the guy could even say, your sins are forgiven, rise up, take your bed, walk. So willing our God is. But to the Pharisees, he says, woe to you. He warns them. Woe to you, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like the white sepulchres, white tombs, which indeed appear beautiful on the outside, but are full within of dead men's bones and all unclean. That's how he talked to the Holier than thou people. And you get that yeast of Pharisees every time a little bit in the church. Not you guys, but I'm just saying. They'll always be fighting. This church is wrong. That church, how could the young people wear jeans? And how could he have a t-shirt? How could she dress like this? And, and they're all hung up about other people's lifestyle. And Jesus called them hypocrites. You judge people because they had divorces or they had, you know, they failed in their marriages and you're very quick to put terms and label people and you change the price tag on people that Jesus said you're valuable but you undervalued people that have come into the house of God. Jesus hates those kind. He turns his guts out. He says, you woe to you. Bad things going to happen. I want to say to any one of us who've got pharisaical spirit, repent. Yeah. Before something, oh, how could he allow such people in his church? How could the, and, and I get that all the time. All right? So it's not a lot, it's some, a little, that can sometimes cause us to be confused and, and, and what's going on, why, why these people, they look pious, they look pious, they are holy. You know, they, they all have the same hairstyle, they're all trimmed, they're very high. Praise the Lord. They have the right words, the right terminology, and the right way to walk as well. Oh, they could almost float on the floor. Yeah. And they got, oh, how come they, what's up with this? They drink wine. They use real wine in their communion. I would say, bless God, I would have joined that church if they drank real wine. You know, and they're always upset about something. How come this church doesn't preach on the second coming? Or how come this church is not talking about the Antichrist? Or how come this... You, you're full of dead man's bones, you stink. You know, when you have the anointing of the Holy Spirit, anointing means oil. Anyone who is lubricated looks fresh. God doesn't want us to be starchy or don't. He said, watch out. And then he talks about the yeast of the Herods. 
The Herods are the secular world. They're always making fun of Christians, undermining us. They're a Christian, Jesus Christ. And I played golf with fellas like that. You know, they, you Christians, and they've got all kinds of dirty jokes about Christians every time when I'm playing golf with them. And they're, and they're thinking, why do I even hang out with them? Because I know who I am. You can take your best shot at me. I'll still be around. I'm not going to be so sensitive. How can you talk about my Jesus? I'm not playing golf with you anymore. I'm just going to play with the Christians. No, 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 no. Just watch over time. I'll beat you. So I started firstly beating them at golf. And then, honestly, I'm not being bragful. I prayed for many of them. Stayed with that friend. I wanted to get out as hell. I said, I don't need this crap. You know, my old Joe Ramaya was coming out of me. I wanted to wrap a chair. At one time, I almost did wrap a chair around a guy. And I just had to back off. Jesus is watching. Be a good boy. Come out! <laughs> and you know, slowly and surely, I thank God. They're still my friends. Some of them have believed in Jesus Christ. Some of them have not. Still my friends. Not my job to change them but I will never be intimidated by people making fun of me or my church or my Jesus. I get hurt. I feel for my Lord because I love him so much and I'm passionate about Jesus, but I will not be intimidated by you. So watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees. Don't get sucked in. Don't, don't get pulled in by them and say, yeah, I know, you know, churches are hypocrites. You do not talk about the bride of Jesus Christ that way. Jesus said, I'm coming for my bride, and it'll be perfect. They will be without spot or wrinkle. We should be cleaning the church if we do see some wrinkles. We should be covering each other with the blood of Jesus Christ. We should be standing together because this is Jesus' bride, the church of Jesus Christ. He said, I'll build my church. So who in hell has been stopping you? Are the people who are sanctimonious on the outside, all pure, white, and critical of the rest of the world. We are the true church. We've heard that said. Or these people, they worship God up on a shop lot somewhere. And their music is like rock and roll. Ha, ha, ha. Some of the pubs are even better. But these Christians, they are cult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard it all before. Heard it all. It's a young pastor starting out until today. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is still the power of God change people. Amen. So, before you allow people to put you in a certain category, you find out who you are in Christ Jesus. And you go to him, he'll tell you exactly who you are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Let's stand together. We're going to sing a worship chorus together, it's okay? All right, after that, we want to just spend a bit of time praying. And maybe some of you, you're not sure where you stand. Why don't you find your, your footing in Christ? Yeah? Stop getting other people to identify you, label you, pat you on the back. And some people love to do that, but that's not their call. God is the one that called you, loves you. Close your eyes for a while. Let the musicians and singers lead you in a worship song together. Maybe today you cannot confidently say that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. Maybe you've heard what some say and some say. And it's normally a, a minority. And but today in your heart of hearts, you are saying, you know, I want to be able to say that about Him, that He is my best friend, that I'm a friend of God that he's a good father. I want to know that personally. I want to walk with that. I don't want to just parrot what somebody else said or what I, what I heard or what I read. Maybe today you want to make a decision to, to say, I want Jesus to be my God and my Lord. You've been thinking about it, but you've been checking the church out. And like everyone you've heard of our how frail the church and how weak the church. But you know, it's Jesus' church. And he said, I will build my church. This is his church. This is not Pastor Joe's church. Don't ever, ever think that this church belongs to Pastor Joe, Pastor Stella. There's no hierarchy here. There's no, 
anyone who owns the building or owns the church, you belong to Jesus Christ. You don't belong to a man or a denomination. And he said, I'm going to build you. He's so interested in building you. Now, building takes skill. It takes time. It takes planning many times. But it's got to start first and foremost with you knowing him as your Lord and your God. You've got to have that personal relationship. You may have been to church. You may be interested in Christianity. It's a wonderful, fashionable thing to be a Christian. You can wear a cross. You can get a tattoo. Very fashionable. But putting all that aside, you've got to know the God of the church, the boss, my best friend. Sometimes I'll talk to him, I'll call him my Lord. Sometimes I'll call him, hey boss. I have this relationship with him like, well, you hired me, you've got to pay me. <laughs> and nobody can fire me if you hired me. So I'm not insecure about my job or my position or my calling. So I can go to a place like England and speak to people in, in high places, lords and ladies even. I remember going to Newcastle, speaking to them. And here I am just an ordinary Malaysian Indian. You know, and tease them and talk about Jesus and pray for them, get them filled with the Holy Spirit. Or I could speak in a pub and I've spoken in some of the pubs in Liverpool while they're all singing their, their songs in a typical Liverpool pub. I've been there. Yeah. And I said, hey, we've never seen you before. Would you like to sing? Would I like to sing? <laughs> Bring it on, baby. <laughs> so I go up there, sing, and then I'm sharing. I'm preaching to truck drivers and, and rough people in a British pub. I'm not insecure about who I am. I make mistakes, just like any one of you. But I'm a child of God. And I know He likes you the same way He likes me. God has got no favorites. But if you don't know that, maybe today you want to start a journey with Him like you've never started with Him before. So I want everybody to close your eyes, just for a few moments. Mean it with all your heart, all right? You ready? I want you to pray out loud if you can, but from your heart. Everybody praying together. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus I receive you. You. As my Lord, as my, Lord, as my, Savior, as my Savior, thank you, thank you for, dying for, my sin, for dying for my sin, taking my place, taking my place and my hell, and, and giving me your life. I receive your life. I receive, your life. I receive, everything, I receive everything that you died to give me. That you died to give me. I, thank you I thank you for freeing me, for freeing me from, the law, from the law, from the curse, from the, curse, from the demands. From the of religion, of religion and setting me free, setting me free to become a child of God from this on from this day onward from this day onwards, I ask you, I ask you to, come into my life to come into my life and stay life. with me stay with me thank you for hearing thank you for hearing and answering my prayer, and answering my prayer because I ask it in Jesus name so ask in Jesus name now when Peter said you are the Christ Jesus said now I say to you so there's something going to happen in your life right now. Something's going to happen. The Holy Spirit's going to open something in your spirit. A revelation of who you are. Some people may have painted some very ugly pictures of yourself. Yeah. Religion does that. Paints you as you're not good enough. So you live like that. According to that painting. That religion has built. Some of you have allowed society, the secular world, the world of the herons, proud, arrogant. Christians are spineless, they say. You gotta be a fighter, you gotta punch back. But they don't understand, you got weapons they don't have. You have connections they don't know. Because your God owns the heavens and the earth. He can move people out of position if He wants to. Sometimes he won't, but he'll just let you sit in there so that you become bigger and stronger than your very enemies. How many times I try to pray, pray off my golfing buddies, especially the ones who are the nastiest. Hope they'll die. <laughs> and then God will really rebuke me like, that's not my spirit, son. That's not me. Come on. I want you strong. But Lord, I want to quit after the 16th hole. There are two more holes to go, son. You finish the golf game like a man, even though you were just ticked off by what this guy said. It's, it, it's called, it's, it's a psychological thing. When people play golf, they kind of they say things that will get you off your focus. 
so that your next tea you're just going and you get really really thick while they can while they can say things I can't so I can't say things as a Christian so what I normally do is when I'm really thick I just laugh I just laugh but inside I'm saying <laughs> so God knows we go through struggles like that but he says to you so today Holy Spirit is going to birth something in you so I want us still to be in an atmosphere of prayer let the Holy Spirit redecorate your distorted uh, your distorted frame of mind there's a picture that's been distorted there in your life somebody painted might have been your parents they may not have meant it might have been associates, marriage, relationships, boyfriend, girlfriend, partners. Beware the yeast of the herons. Watch out. Don't let them keep you in their frame. Break out. Some of you, in Jesus' name, you've got to break out of that. Huh? Because you came from a different country, you, you have a different colored skin, you speak with a different accent, and so they, they kind of marginalize you or put you in a frame. You don't have to fight and prove anything. You know, when, when Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? And they said, some say, some say. Jesus didn't fight or contradict. He didn't argue about what people said. He just said, who do you say that I, the son of man? All right? So we don't have to go around proving anything to anybody. You need to discover who your true worth is and you're valuable. It's, you're so valuable, God gave His only Son. Blood was spilled for you. Life was given. Not the blood of a prophet or even an angel, God's only Son. So that's how precious you are. So please, stop living in the framework of the Herods because they put you like that, painted you like that. All the Pharisees, oh, they would love to say, these are good Christians. These are not so pious Christians. I qualify for the ones that are supposed to be bad Christians, bad testimony. Honestly, a guy actually said to me, he said, I look at you and I feel sorry for your church. I said, I look at my church and I feel sorry for me. <laughs> yeah, so people like to frame you, you know. Have you had a vision of demonic powers? One guy asked me, I mean, even if I had, I was not going to brag about it because he was about to label me. Now that you've had this vision, you are a mighty man. You mean to say my visions of demons qualify me to be a mighty man? Or would it be better if you had said, if you had visions of God? So, but some people, you see, that's, that's the east of the Pharisees. They're always trying to grade you. Okay? They love to grade you. Food laws. Oh, you guys in Klang, you eat pork. Don't you know it's an unclean animal? Yeah, but it tastes damn good. <laughs> I'm not a Jew. I'm an Indian, a Gentile, born again child of God. Equal to any person who might claim that they are direct descendants of Abraham. Even so, through Christ Jesus, we became the sons and daughters of Abraham. And we get that same privilege and the prosperity and all of that. And still eat pork. What's up with that? How good is that? So good, isn't it? So Christian life is simple, but people would love to complicate you. But how come they didn't play, pray in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit? They're all going, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Somebody, some Pharisee somewhere will try to make you uncomfortable. Don't let them. Beware, Jesus said. Do you get it? Got it? You got what your miracles are for? Pray for me, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. Miracles happen. Did you get it? Do you know what that was for? Yeah. Father, we lift our hands. I can just see, I'm saying what the Holy Spirit is doing right now. I'm just seeing some pictures are being torn down from your mind. I see some paintings are being torn by the Holy Spirit. You gave somebody permission to print some things there. Holy Spirit is washing it out. He's going to paint you some great pictures of who you are. 
Oh, some things are falling. That's why I was speaking. That's how speaking the Holy Spirit was doing that. Maybe you came from a cultural background where Christians, if they were culturally Christian, don't get too zealous. Don't believe that God can do miracles. Don't believe that God can prosper you. All those things are nice in the Bible, but it's not going to happen to you. See, those are called cultural Christianity. Cultural. Because it's nice. So Holy Spirit is doing some things, He's tearing some things off your mind in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let's see all the guys. Come on, men. You sound really man like come on gentlemen. Let's have the ladies, ladies. Come on, ladies. Like a choir. Come on, ladies, you can do better. Yep. Have that defiance. Get out of whatever people said. They said this about you. They said that. Break out of that mindset. Get yourself free. Come on, ladies, one more time. 